Good morning. I um, hope you observe that our um, youth are back from the mission field. We sent them away last week and they came back. And uh, good news, all of them returned. We didn't lose any. And that's a good thing. And they had a phenomenal time. And um, next week, we'll get to hear some snapshots as I bring Daniel up here and he's able to share with you some of the stuff that went on. Um, coincidences happen when people pray, but they're not coincidences at all, are they? That God orchestrates them and his timing and his wonderful sovereignty, and he really does care. He cares intimately about every single one of us. He knows every single struggle we go through, and so he's not absent. He's intimately aware and he's involved. Um, I, I want to I pray for you this morning, and um, there'll be a time where I invite you just to silently pray where you are. Um, so if you would, just bow your heads. Lord, right now, I pray for every single person in here. They are here. I pray that um, none of this time would be wasted um, by me, the communicator, but also by every person in here who's listening. And so, Holy Spirit, I invite you to do what you do best, and that's to engage us, to cause us to um, uh, change and to mold us and to um, change how we think, to reprogram us. Probably every single one of us, including me, through the course of this week, we've, we've exchanged the truth of God for a lie. And it's just the culture we live in. It's so easy to do. I pray that every single one of us here would exchange that lie we bought into, whatever it is, and we would re-exchange it for the truth of who you are and um, what you say in your word. Lord, probably every one of us has somebody in mind that we think, God, would you do this in that person's life? Right now, I would invite you, just in the silence of where you're sitting, just to pray for whatever person just came to your mind, that you think, God, I wish you would do this for this person. What is it that you want to do? What is it that you want God to do for you? In silence where you are, ask God to do that. God, we pray that this message would have its perfect timing, that it would intersect with all of us based upon um, what you want to say to us. It's in Jesus' name we pray, and all God's people said, amen. Did you ever notice how difficult it is to get something done that you want to get done? Cleaning the car? washing the dog, mowing the lawn, changing the oil. We are notorious for putting stuff off, aren't we? Getting our finances in order, maybe getting in a Bible study, initiating time with someone, getting in shape, eating right, writing those thank yous that we put off, getting someone a gift, getting our hair cut, fixing the roof, cleaning the gutters, painting the house, cleaning out the closets, Attacking, and I say attacking because that's what it needs, the kids' rooms. What about the attic? Do I need to go on? You get the picture, don't you? What keeps us from doing what needs to get done? Well, in a nutshell, it's that word. It's that nasty word. It's called procrastination. This is what procrastination is. Procrastination is the avoidance of doing a task that needs to be accomplished over a certain time frame. You know, the question that comes to mind is, how prevalent is procrastination? We all look at it from our own personal grid, but let's kind of get an aerial shot of it. How prevalent is this thing called procrastination? Well, if you're a procrastinator, feel at ease because you're in good company. 52% of people have a moderate to high need for help concerning their procrastination. 
75% of college students recently said they consider themselves procrastinators. In 2007, in 2007, a study on procrastination discovered this. People, and I quote, people will delay an intended course of action despite expecting to be worse off for the delay. In other words, you know it's not the best course of action to procrastinate, but you do it anyway. Do I have any fellow procrastinators out there? Yeah, go ahead. Confession is good for the soul. It's okay. Yeah, we've got a special counseling session for you. The Deacons Fund, which we'll be raising next week, will go towards assisting you in the payment of your counseling for that. Procrastination. Here are some of the things that psychologists have determined how we deal with procrastination. See if you feel and fit into one of these categories. Psychologists will tell us that one of the ways is avoidance. We avoid the situation or location where we would have to deal with something we don't want to deal with. For instance, the desk. If that's where the bills pile up, well, you're just going to avoid being around the desk, won't you? Another way we deal or don't deal with procrastination is something called denial. Pretending that we're not actually procrastinating. So that thought of, well, you know what? They weren't expecting a thank you. Or they, they wouldn't have written me a thank you. So we just kind of deny the fact that we don't call it what it really is. And then there's the inevitable distractions. How we procrastinate? Well, we distract ourselves. We immerse ourselves in an action that prevents us from doing what needs to get done. Make sense? Web browsing, video games, television surfing. Another way we avoid doing what needs to be done is comparison. We procrastinate, and my procrastination, though, isn't near as bad as that other person's procrastination, right? And that makes us feel better when we compare ourselves to somebody who's worse. And then how we procrastinate, how we enable ourselves is, well, we blame forces that are keeping us from getting stuff done. If it wasn't for, and then you fill in the blank, I would have gotten that done by now. And you can fill in that blank with a person. If, I, if it wasn't for so-and-so, I would have already gotten this done. Or the circumstances. If it wasn't for these circumstances, I would have already got this stuff done. And then what seems strange is psychologists will tell us that one of the big things that causes us to procrastinate is something they call mocking, where you basically use sarcasm and humor about yourself. You degrade yourself because then what happens is they say that laughter enables us to keep procrastinating. For instance, if you throw in a clause, well, that's just the way I am, or, well, you know me, and so we make fun of ourselves, and in doing so, we enable ourselves to continue the bad pattern. We come to find out procrastination is somewhat normal. Because what happens is we do what we like to do, we procrastinate about things we don't like to do. So it's really normal. However, psychologists will tell us too much procrastination can lead to stress, anxiety, guilt, depression, even a low self-esteem. But here's the biggest reason that people procrastinate. It's called personal afflictions. It's reality. It's sickness of a loved one. It's the tragedies of life. It's the loss of a job. It's a financial collapse. And these are real events that happen to all of us. And when they come, they emotionally drain all of our resources. And no one can argue that when one of those calamities happens, well, they demand immediate attention. Let's face it, when a loved one is sick, you could care less if the roof leaks or not, right? Well, all of this, when it comes to even the mild procrastination as well as the pain of life, all of it falls under the category where it keeps us from doing what God has called us to do as believers. And what we will see in the scriptures is an understanding that if we are looking for the perfect time when these events, when they don't distract us to do what needs to be done, well, the scriptures teach us that perfect time where we're not distracted by those inevitable difficulties, that time is never coming. 
There are and always will be circumstances that we can use as excuses to keep us from getting things done that need to get done. There's always going to be excuses to procrastinate. And the message to Paul, and now from Paul to us, the message in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 1 through 10, is that the time is now. All that stuff that we're procrastinating on, the time is now. But it's not just stuff. It's just not, it's not about cleaning out the attic. The time is now for us to engage in what God has called us to do. To obey what God has called us to do is now. No matter what we're dealing with, we will still do, we still need to do what God has called us to do. And somebody could say, well, e even on our deathbed? Well, this is where Paul would say, especially on your deathbed. Do what God has called you to do. The thing about God is he is not afraid to call us on obedience. He, he, he is tougher on us than we are on ourselves. He is tougher on us than we are with each other. I think that what we'll find this morning is that the very thing that keeps us from doing what God is calling us to do is the very thing that God wants to use in us to do what he wants to do. Now let me make that statement again. The very thing that keeps us from doing what God is calling us to do, well, it's the very thing that God wants to use in us to do what he wants us to do. You think, well, man, there's tough circumstances. Yes, in the midst of tough circumstances, God is calling you to obey him. In fact, he is using those tough circumstances to cause you to obey because that's how he can use you most mightily. Now, let me review just a little bit. We ended chapter 5 last week. We are doing a study. If you're new here, we've been going through the book of 2 Corinthians. Last week, we finished with chapter 5. And in chapter 5, God clearly laid out for us the ministry that he's given each one of us as his followers. As a follower of Jesus Christ, he has given us what he calls the ministry of reconciliation. Well, what does that mean? Well, all of us were adversaries to Christ. We were born adversaries to Jesus Christ. We were born with this sin capacity which separated us from God. And so what God did when he gave of himself, he emptied himself to bridge the gap, to reconcile us to him, that's what he did on the cross. He died on the cross. He rose according to the scriptures. Um, he, he, he paid the penalty for our sin. And as a result of that, he makes reconciliation with himself possible. We were all antagonists to him before we came to know Jesus Christ. We were not his friend. We were his enemy. We despised him. We were disobedient to him. And then he bridged that gap. And because he makes us his no longer adversary, he makes us his friend, then he gives us the capacity to reconcile relationships with one another. So now we pick it up in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 1 and 2. Now I'm reading from the New American Standard Version. You can read along, or you can look at the NIV in your back pew if you'd like. But let me read in chapter 6, starting in verse 1, verses 1 and 2. It says, and working together with him. Now remember, he's talked to us about, he's given us the ministry of reconciliation. So, working together with him to that end, we also urge you not to receive the grace of God in vain. Verse 2, for he says, at the acceptable time, and when you see it kind of highlighted here, he's quoting something out of the Old Testament. We'll see that in a second. At the acceptable time, I listen to you. And on the day of salvation, I helped you. Behold, now is the acceptable time. Now is the day of salvation. The question is, how could the Corinthians receive the grace of God in vain? Well, to receive something in vain is to not receive it at all. The truth is, they didn't receive the gospel. The gospel that Jesus died according to scriptures, that he was buried according to scriptures, that he rose from the grave according to scriptures, that's the gospel. And to receive the grace of God in vain is to make the gospel to be something that it's not. By taking away from the gospel or adding to the gospel, well, that's the formula that turns it into something that it is not. And that was the case in Corinth, and that's the case today. There's false messengers in our culture, there always have been, that have poisoned the church, and they continue to poison the church today with a false gospel. 
See, for people to be reconciled to Jesus Christ, there is one message and one message only. And that message is Jesus died, and Jesus was buried, and Jesus rose. And in that act on the cross, we believe that we are saved by grace through faith. In other words, our salvation is earned by Jesus plus nothing. We can't earn it. You know, to add to the cross says that it's not enough. People say, well, you know what, yeah, well, this church or that church or that, they've got a version, and at least the gospel's in there. No, 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 you add to the, to the cross, and what you're saying is that it's not enough. To take away from what Christ did on the cross is to say, well, the cross really isn't needed, that you can get to salvation in other ways. There is one gospel, and there is no power in a wrong gospel. Now, in verse 2, Paul quotes Isaiah chapter 49, verse 8. And he's quoting this in context to rebuttal those who were adding to the to-do list of the requirements for salvation at the cross. And what happens is, when you use that verse this way, the quote gives validity to the fact that salvation is God's initiative alone. Paul's message is, now is the time to accept God's salvation. And therefore, now is the time to be a part of pointing out to others that salvation is found in no one else. In other words, don't wait for your life to get all together before you accept God's payment for your sin. The time is now. Don't wait till you get all of your ducks in a row to be a minister of reconciliation. The time is now. Now he says in verse 3, notice what he says in verse 3. It's just this one little short verse. He says, giving no cause for offense in anything in order that the ministry not be discredited. Paul was so intentional about the ministry of reconciliation that he was so intense on making sure that no behavior of his would be an obstacle that would keep people away from Jesus. And that's passed down to us. In all situations, we should be determined to commend ourselves as a faithful minister of God. Look at what it says in verse 4 now. It says in verse 4, he says this, but in everything commending, now if you're an underliner, underline that word and I'll come back to it, in everything commending ourselves as servants of God in much endurance, in afflictions, in hardships, and in distresses. Commend is a translation from a word that literally means to exhibit. The word could be used as put on your showroom as a display. And so in the context here, Paul is saying, I want to put on my showroom my afflictions, my hardships, and distresses. Because I want to show you that the gospel is all about God and it's not about my abilities. Paul was not afraid to put on display his broken life that God can do through his broken, chipped life. And so it is for us. We were just, I was just with the living room a little bit ago, and they were sharing testimonies. And one of the things that we pointed out, one of the things that we shared, is a testimony has nothing to do with how great we are. A testimony has got to do with everything that God does in and through us. It shines a flashlight on him. Now, what I want you to do, if you could, go back to verse 3. What I want you to do, go back to verse 3, because Paul knew that the cross itself will offend people. Here's why. The cross communicates that there is only one way to God, and we aren't it. We are not able to overcome our sin. You know, in the culture in which we live, we don't like to say that other ways to heaven are wrong. And the world will tell us that that's not loving. But in actuality, that's the most loving thing that we can do. Because to love someone enough to tell them that the road they are on will lead to their destruction, though not easy, it is anything but unloving. See, the gospel itself will be an issue. It'll be a hard issue for some to grasp. So we don't need to, a secondary issue to cloud the issue of the gospel. Secondary issues that can distract people from the real issue could be our bad behavior. And 
Paul is saying we don't need to give people an excuse not to look at the gospel. And the evil one has always used the, well, they don't, pointing fingers at us Christians, they, those Christians, don't live consistent with what they say. They don't live out what they say they believe has been used for centuries to keep people from examining what Christ has done on the cross. Now go back to verse 4. Back to verse 4, for Paul begins to list or he categorizes some of his life events that he wants to put on display. And he's doing this so that you will say, hey, look at these events that I'm putting on display that my life has been through. So people will look at the greatness of God, not at his abilities. So Paul puts these three categories on display. He says, afflictions. First of all, afflictions are basically stress, pressure, trouble. Anybody been through stress? Hmm? If you have children, you've been through stress. Children don't experience stress, but they are carriers, right? You've experienced stress. You've experienced pressures. I was talking to somebody today. I mean, this is all too common. You you felt that pressure where you lost your job? And I don't make light of that. Where you felt like, oh, God, I've got mouths to feed. Have you been there? If you're old enough, you've been there, right? Guys, we know what that feeling is. It's horrible. And you go, God, I, I got this stress. I got this pressure. I got this trouble. Then he says this other thing. He says, hardships. He's been through hardships. You know what a hardship is? A hardship is something you go through that's so difficult that you can't get out of it on your own. That you need assistance from somebody else. And this is what's really hard in our 21st century Christianity. We go through something and somebody asks, hey, how are you doing? Hey, you need some help. No, no, I'm fine. No, I got it. Why is that? When you're surrounded by the body of Christ who is put around you to help you get through something you were never intended to get through on your own, that's a hardship where you need help because, man, it hurts and you can't get out of it on your own. And then he uses the word distresses. Another word for it is calamities. It's a word. This is what it literally means. You need to understand, every word in your Bible at one time was a secular word. Do you realize that? Every word in your Bible at one time was a secular word, and now it's being used to describe that which is infinite in our God qualities that we see in God. And so he uses the word distresses, calamities. It literally means to be squeezed through a tiny opening. You ever been through a situation where it was difficult and you felt, and you may have even used this term, I feel squeezed. All of us have felt squeezed from time to time. And when you feel squeezed, you feel like you go through a tiny opening and you know what? I'm so squeezed, I can't get the resources I need through this tiny opening. How am I going to get through this? There are many types of difficulties that will come our way that squeeze us. And what Paul does is after he lists these qualities that keep us from doing what God has for us to do, he goes on to detail some of the specific troubles he's encountered during his ministry that have squeezed him. Look at verse 5. Verse 5, he says, In beatings, in imprisonments, in tumults, in labors, in sleeplessness, in hunger... First of all, he says in beatings. Paul was literally physically beaten. None of us have been beaten for our faith, I doubt. But you know what? I would bet that maybe you've been emotionally beaten, haven't you? Where maybe somebody looks at you at school or at work and goes, you believe that stuff? That's an emotional beating. Paul was beaten with rods, Recorded in Acts chapter 16, verse 22, and in Philippi. The, and then he says imprisonments, where he literally, because of his faith, he was thrown into jail. In Philippi and Jerusalem and Caesarea and Rome. We create our own imprisonments, don't we? When we're enslaved to something, 
that takes us out of the fight. Tumults, that's a fancy word for riots. Paul, wherever Paul went, he would preach. And what would happen in Lystra and Philippi and Thessalonica? He would begin to preach and a riot would break out. Several years ago, the the Archbishop of Canterbury said, wherever Paul went, a riot broke out. Wherever I go, they serve tea. You know, you have to think that are we representing Christ or are we just trying to make people happy? See, Christ was the one who told us, if you accurately represent me, what will happen is it will be a rub because people don't like to hear that Jesus is the only way. Then he says, labors. Paul pioneered through the groundbreaking work of taking the gospel to the Gentiles. One of the things I, 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 I talked with Daniel when they came back, he goes, he's exhausted. Because you know what? Doing God's work takes an effort. All our high school students that came back, man, they're exhausted. Why? Because they worked hard in their labors. And Paul, just to throw in something, the biggest obstacle to our labors is not the non-believing world, but it's the religious world that throws obstacles in our way. And then he says, hey, what about in sleeplessness? You need to understand something. You begin to engage in people. You want to help people out? As a shepherd, there are thoughts that punish you at night because you, you see people's destructive behavior. And there are times where I go to bed, and I, I'm sure the other pastors can say the same thing, and some of the elders can say the same thing, where you stare at the ceiling and you can't go to sleep because part of going on, when you start engaging with people's troubles, you, you can't get to sleep at night because you see people's destructive patterns. And, and then he says, hunger. And I want you to understand the principle in this. Part of Taking the gospel into uncharted territory is your needs are not always catered to. Missionaries of old understood that, and I wonder if we really understand that. We think, let's grease the wheels, let's make everything just perfect so that all our needs are met before we go. That's our expectation. And we take that into our place of work. Well, you know, I don't want to cause an issue in our place of work, and I want to make sure that all the I's are dotted and the T's are crossed, and I don't want to, you know, I don't want to be offensive. And sure, we want to be amiable. But the gospel divides. People don't like it. And your needs, when you represent Jesus Christ, are not always catered to. And that's not a 21st century Christian mentality because we've created churches very conducive for your needs. What can we do for you? And Christ is going, wait a minute, no, no, no. I've asked you to take up your cross and follow me. So it's kind of counterintuitive. Missionaries of old understood this because in the 1700s, 1800s, they knew that if they went to certain parts of the world, they would contact some illness that would eventually take them to their death. And so many times what happened is missionaries would pack their belongings in their casket because they knew where they were going didn't have the wood conducive for burial. Can you imagine this? Say, hey, mom and dad, I'm going on the mission field. Oh, I'm so proud of you, honey. Here, let me help you pack your casket. It doesn't compute in our culture. And yet, isn't that what God called us to do? To lay our life down for the greater good of others? That eternity is a real thing. But no, no, we got to protect the here and now. Paul goes on in verse 6 and 7, he lists personal benefits that he experienced for the obstacles that he was forced to overcome. You know, interesting... We, we look at afflictions as hardships as, and distresses. We look at those as inconveniences. Once we deal with those afflictions, once we deal with those hardships, once we deal with those distresses, then I'll be freed up to get those things done that God has called me to do. Paul looked at them as character producers. He didn't look at them as inconveniences at all. And look at verse 6 and 7. Paul is saying, because of afflictions, hardships, and distresses, notice what he says. He says, now I'm operating in purity. 
in knowledge, in patience, in kindness, in the Holy Spirit, in genuine love, in the word of truth, in the power of God, by the weapons of righteousness for the right hand and the left. Let me break down each one of those. He says as a result of these afflictions, these hardships, these distresses, God is producing in him, and he first of all, he says, purity. Well, wouldn't it make sense? I mean, God is holy, so it isn't asking too much of us to be holy so we can accurately represent him. So God uses these hardships, squeezes us so that we too will be pure. Then notice this, he says, knowledge. We think of knowledge, we define knowledge as just cognitive information. Knowledge is much more than that. The definition of knowledge is insight colored with experience. See, knowledge coupled with experience causes us to be able to relate when we teach. People don't care what you know until they know that you've been through what they have been through and you can relate to them. You don't want to hear me just read from a textbook. You want to know that I've experienced pain too. When you teach somebody, you don't want to just, hey, keep it at the peripheral level. You want to be able to go, wait, you can relate to me. You've hurt too. You've experienced that. Then he talks about patience. You know, Paul was fervent. Paul was a get-it-done type guy that few can compare to, but yet he was still forbearing with those that were hard to love. He was patient. And he says, in kindness. You know what he's saying? He says, these afflictions, these hardships, these distresses have produced in me a kindness. We define kindness as, oh, that's, you're nice. No, no, no. That's not what kindness is. Kindness means usefulness. To be kind is to make yourself available for the greater good of others. Wow, what a different definition. Well, I was being nice. Well, being nice is you, you don't want to ruffle somebody's feathers. Being kind is to move into somebody's life to give them what they really mostly need. And then he says, because of these afflictions, because I'm squeezed, you know, the Holy Spirit has flourished in me. Paul, despite his high level of energy, Paul was quick to point out, all trials make you dependent on the Holy Spirit to do for you what you cannot do for yourself. That's what the Holy Spirit does. The Holy Spirit enables you to do for your, he does for you what you cannot do for yourself. And then he says, genuine love. See, when we are broken, God infuses in us an authentic care for those we minister to. Because until we're broken, it's still about us. But then once we go through an affliction, it's like, wow, God wants me. I need to. It's the best thing for me to turn my life, my focus onto others and genuinely love them. And then he says, word of truth. It's truthful speech. See, the truth that God wants people to hear that's life-transforming is to tell people not what they want to hear, but what they need to hear. Let me give you a litmus test for a false teacher. A false teacher is only going to tell you what you want to hear. They're nothing more than ice cream salesmen. You want to make people happy? Jeff told me one time, you want to make people happy? Sell ice cream. You know, or in the morning, waffles, I guess. I don't know. But you can tell a false teacher if they only tell you what you want to hear. The scriptures don't do that. Because left to ourselves, we go to the place of least resistance. We go to procrastination, don't we? And yet God says, "Uh uh-uh, I want you to be obedient to me. We, We therefore have to tell people what they, not what they want to hear, but what they need to hear. And then the power of God. Paul knew that... He, he produced zero life change in others. It's only by God's power we can be used. See, when we're afflicted, we realize that we are powerless. Then he goes on, he says, there's weapons of righteousness. Who are your right hand and left hand? What, what he's saying here, he's going, you know what? This is a Roman culture. They understood this. They understood the paradigm of a Roman soldier because they saw him everywhere. And a Roman soldier had a spear in his right hand and he had a shield in his left hand. The spear was to attack, the shield was to protect. He never left home without it. And the weapons of righteousness is the word of God. It's our shield and our sword not to leave home without it. Can you imagine going into battle and you show up for battle and you go, oh, 
what? I forgot my shield. I forgot my, I forgot my sword. I forgot my spear. Darn the luck. Well, that's ridiculous. And yet Christians are in a battle all the time. Even if you don't realize it or not, you live in a world where your battle is not against flesh and blood, but is against the principalities, the rulers, and spiritual forces in the heavenlies. That's, you, you're, you're surrounded by a battle. And you can't leave home without your sword and your shield, the Word of God. That means you've got to know it. You've got to spend time in it. You've got to understand it. You've got to know the Word. And again, know the world so you know what in the world to do with the Word. Afflictions, hardships, distresses. When we are squeezed, this is what is produced. Purity, knowledge, patience, kindness, Holy Spirit, learning to depend on Him, genuine love, the word of truth, the power of God. We learn to depend on our weapons of righteousness. Don't you see all of the things that we use as excuses to keep us out of ministry are the very things that Paul says God uses in us to make us usable in ministry. Well, that doesn't feel good, Dan. That's hard. Yes, it's hard. But God's not easy on us. He pushes us to be more than we could ever be on our own. Now in verses 8 to 10, Paul shows how God uses the paradoxes we experience for the ministry. This is just kind of a summary. He says in verse 8, By glory and dishonor, by evil report and good report, regard as, as deceivers and yet true, as unknown yet well known, as dying yet behold, we live as punished yet not put to death, as sorrowful yet always rejoicing, as poor yet making many rich, as having nothing yet possessing all things. Notice the back and forth, the high and the low. Paul experienced the entire spectrum of public opinion. Some gave him glory, some gave him dishonor. Some did evil to him, some did good to him. Some tried to deceive him, others told him the truth. And all of this, all of these self-appointed judges, Paul knew who his ultimate judge was. Six months earlier, he had written and said, you know what, I, I don't cower to your judgment nor do I even count on my own judgment because God alone is my judge. God is the one to answer to. Who are you answering to? All those self-appointed magistrates that are trying to tell you how to live your life or are you answering to God himself? Paul in his ministry was unknown by some, but he was well known by others. Paul was at the hands of some. He almost died, but he lived. At the hands of others, he was punished, but they didn't kill him. Paul knew who was responsible for his future. You know, we, we live our lives as though it's so out of, oh, it's out of God's control. Oh, I wish, I wish, I hope, I hope this doesn't happen. Do you understand? God has your future in his hand. He is sovereign. He is in control. He is responsible for your future. Therefore, you can move into the future with assurance that he is good and that you will be used for his kingdom. Emotionally, Paul, at times, he was sorrowful, yet even in the midst of his sorrow, he rejoiced. How do you do that? He was many times, he was poor, but simultaneously, he was rich. Sometimes having nothing, yet simultaneously having everything. Have you ever used the phrase, and I know I have, where you go, I, I got nothing. You come to a situation and you go, I've got nothing. I got no energy, I've got no power, I've got nothing to say. You know what? Paul is slapping us on the hand and he's saying, you think you've got nothing, but yet you've got everything. I got nothing. Paul is saying to us, you have all the resources of heaven to keep you going and to help others in the ministry of reconciliation. Do you realize that? The very thing that you're going, oh, once this is together, then I'll be freed up. No, 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 Paul's going, you've got all the resources of heaven to help you through the circumstances you're going through to be obedient to do what God has for you right now. There's part of me that says, oh, I, I want ease and comfort. And God goes, no, 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 I want... I've got all the resources that you need to put, 
push you through all of the difficulties that you've got going on. You think those difficulties are a delay? God's going, obey me in the difficulties because that's how I want to use you. Even on my deathbed, especially on your deathbed. What? Because God has all the resources of heaven at our disposal. To me, that speaks of the dignity of God. That speaks of the greatness of God in the midst of our weaknesses. See, because God is not afraid to allow you to go through what you're going through. He wants to use you in the midst of this affliction, whatever this affliction is. And all of us have them right now. See, this this isn't some power of positive thinking stuff. This is the power of God in you. And what Paul is saying, the time is now, tap into his sufficiency. Not that you are sufficient of yourself to claiming anything coming from you, for your sufficiency comes from him. He's saying, tap into God's sufficiency. Bow your heads. Right now, every single one of you is going through some sort of affliction, some so you're being squeezed and as a result of being squeezed you're going how am I going to do this do you believe right now God is asking you do you believe that God can pull you through whatever is squeezing you God is saying trust me he's got all the resources of heaven at his disposal to get you through the circumstances you are through, you're going through, and to use you for his glory. So that other people look at you and go, How do they do that? And they see God in you. See all the circumstances we've been running from? God is saying, those are the ones that he wants to use in us right now to do what he has for us to do. Obey him. Enter into the re- to this ministry of reconciliation. If you've never placed your faith in Jesus Christ, first of all, be reconciled to him. God wants a relationship with you. But the problem is, if you've never placed your trust in Christ, that you are separated from him because of this sin capacity. And yet, that's exactly why Christ died on the cross, was to be your substitution. To, he died in your place. He paid the penalty for your sin so you wouldn't have to. But it's not just enough to know that. Each person as an act of their will by faith says, I accept that free gift. Be reconciled to him. The time is now. And if you've been a believer and you've accepted that free gift, the time is now to say, I want to enter into that ministry of reconciliation. That's the ministry he's given us. There's not plan B. There's not other options. He wants us to be involved in that ministry. To point people to the one who died for our sins and enables us to to have all the resources of heaven to get through what we are living through. Life doesn't work without submission. God is asking you to submit to him. That speaks of our great dignity that we were created in him. Let him do in you what you cannot do for yourself. And now, like always, we want to end our time giving us an opportunity to give back but also another opportunity to look up as we worship you and you alone, God. And we do it together. We submit to you. It's in Jesus' name that we've gathered together this morning. And all God's people said, amen. Ushers will take up the offering now. I just ask you to remain seated until that play passes you by and then stand and enjoy.
angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. God bless you. You are dismissed.